841, we have something for Radio Geeks. And I guess I'm in that uh, category. Ken Deutsch was a, a disc jockey in Ohio, and he is now the authority on radio jingles. He's written a few books on the subject and joins us now to talk about all this. And uh, Ken, uh, after you were on the air for a while, you uh, went into production. Is that right? Was that your main business? I did. I was not much of a hit as a disc jockey, uh, not particularly talented, so I had to find something else, and I uh, started a jingle studio, and uh, this was in around 1977. We produced ID call letter type jingles, you know, little things like we just heard that's in your call letters for stations all over the country and all over the world. And uh, did you do commercials for uh, companies as well as radio stations? Yes, we call those uh, commercial jingles, those little 30 and 60 second things that advertise car dealers and jewelry stores and like that. Yes, we did many of those too. And yeah, looking here, I see you worked uh, with United Airlines and Pizza Hut, so uh, you know what you're talking yeah. about. And we've got a sample here of some jingles, and let's start with a couple that I think you dug up from my past in the 70s. Uh, <laughs> and now, now the, these jingles were often done by uh, some pretty talented musicians, correct? Oh, yeah. There were uh, many famous people that sang jingles either before they were famous or sometimes afterwards. You know, people like Janie Fricke and um, Rita Coolidge and a lot of people like that sang, sang jingles along the way. I think we're going to hear the Anita Kerr singers here. Listen to this. W-L-S in Chicago. Yeah. The, Anita Kerr uh, was a successful recording artist. Wasn't she? She was. Uh, for many years, she sang backup on a lot of hits that you know, like Jingle Bell Rock and Big John and, you know, a lot of songs like that for country artists first in Nashville. And then she moved to Chicago and eventually L.A. and sang backup for the Carpenters and a lot of other famous people. She probably released, you know, more than 20 albums of just her music. Here's more from Anita Kerr. And this goes back to, to the 60s. Uh, a really, really great sound. Here it is. Can for a lot of people who grew up around here, hearing something like that, uh, it actually kind of kicks in uh, a nerve, a nostalgic uh, part of you, and it's the same as hearing uh, one of your favorite old rock and roll songs, isn't it? Well, I think that is, is exactly the same principle that worked there. If you, if you think about it, you may not remember what an announcer said in 1962, um, but you will remember a jingle, and even if people haven't heard those jingles in many years, they will, uh, you know, it, it'll touch a nerve. All right, let's get these out of the way before we move on to other radio stations. Now, I must say that uh, the jingle production there, and, and those are from the 70s, obviously, Mm -hmm. The ones from the 60s actually sounded better to me. I thought so, too. The vocal blend was, was sweeter. And in the 70s, there was such a move to do everything so quickly, you know, and jam everything into three or four seconds if you could, where when the Anita Kerr jingles were on the air in the 1960s, early 1960s, they took their time and they created more of a, an image. And uh, I like those better, too, in this case. We'll remember some uh, gone but not forgotten radio stations coming up with uh, Ken Deutsch, co-producer of the Rare and Scratchy Rock and Roll podcast with our friend Dave Milberg. Hang on. More to come. 846 weather right here, Steve. Yeah, we're seeing the temperatures climb. People since 1936. Coming up on 851, Ken Deutsch writes about uh, radio and the radio industry. And we're talking about jingles today. And uh, you know what, Ken? I mean, jingles, as you mentioned, gave radio stations uh, an identity and people remembered them. 
just like they remembered the music, we, we brought back some jingles here at WGN. Uh, why don't radio stations use them today? I don't know. They seem to be kind of out of favor at the moment or just not cool. It's, um, and also, uh, it's, it's another one of those things, one of, one of those financial factors where radio stations, most of them, cut their budgets so short uh, they just can't really afford to produce the kind of jingles they want to. You know, a big-time station like WGN can get nice jingles, but, um, you know, most of the stations in the medium markets just... It's not a budget item anymore like it used to be. We're going to play a jingle now, and Landecker and I have talked about this. We thought these were the best jingles ever produced. I know they were very expensive. Uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about this one in a second, but check this out. Wow. The old WCFL. Yeah, Talk about those jingles, Ken. Well, those were produced in Los Angeles by a guy named Chuck Bloor, who was primarily a radio programmer, and he invented really some of the early days of Top 40 with something he called Color Radio uh, on the West Coast at KFWB, but he also had some radio station clients all over. And he got these jingles for WCFL, had them produced in L.A., and they were so exciting and so much fun. And, you know, some of them are like a minute long. I didn't put that on our little list to go over today. But um, some of them were a minute long. People could take their time and just enjoy them. Yes, and folks remember those. Now, the next one we're going to play from the old WCFL, which is no longer. Uh, now, is this from the mid-'70s, uh, Ken? Right, right. WCFL uh, was, of course, the competing top 40 station to WLS. But in 19, I believe it was in 1975, uh, they blinked and they dropped their top format, top 40 format, and left that to WLS. And for a while, they were beautiful music. And so Larry Lujak, who had been a disc jockey at WCFL, uh, still had a contract for two more years. So he had to just sit there and get paid for two years. But eventually, they tried a lot of different formats. And the, the jingle that you're about to hear now was part of their lifestyle format um the mutual network had a lifestyle format and so that's what this is not a bad jingle but is the reason i don't remember that because nobody listened <laughs> <laughs> that could be at that point all of the top 40 fans went to WLS or they began to go to FM <laughs> and so that's maybe why they don't remember that see if anybody remembers this one yeah for a while they were playing music weren't they mm -hmm. yeah and the thing about that jingle besides the fact that the instrumental track sounds a little like Up, Up, and Away, which had been a popular hit a few months earlier. The thing about that is the logo, W-I-N-D, that's, uh, that's the notes from the movie Gone with the Wind, Tara's theme. Um, and that, that should sound familiar if you listen to it and think about that. And the idea was it's, you know, W-I-N-D, the wind, Gone with the Wind. So they thought that would make sense. Although I don't know if anybody noticed that. <laughs> uh, kind of subtle, you know. WVON was a, a great music station back in the day. Uh, Herb Kent and some tremendous talent on the station. Here's what one of their jingles sounded like. And as you point out, uh, Ken, all, all the singers on the jingle were white, weren't they? They were. They were. And uh, WVON, the call letters stand for, VON stands for the Voice of Negro. Mm -hmm. And that's what they were when they went on the air. And they did serve the black market, um, the urban market we call it today. But uh, it was a great station to listen to. I, I was born in Chicago and lived there until 1962, and I used to listen to it. So, you know. It was great. The old WMAQ uh, went through many uh, incarnations, uh, music, talk, and this is from their country period. 
Who's the friend of a truck driving man? WMAQ Country Music Radio. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did they spend any money on those, Ken? Oh, yeah. That was a pretty expensive package by a big Dallas uh, jingle firm called TM Productions. And the guy they got to come in and sing that was a guy named Ronnie Dawson, who uh, was kind of a Jerry Reed wannabe. Hmm. So if you, if you listen to the way he sounds, he, he sounds a little like Jerry Reed. Here's another country station, uh, WJJD at the time. The home of the Western Gentleman, WJJD, 1160. And let me slip one more in here. Uh, another AM Soul station in Chicago was WGRT. WGRT, Soul of Chicago. Ken Deutsch, I know we've awakened uh, the geek and many old radio fans. Uh, if they want to read more about jingles, hear more jingles, and uh, check out uh, some of your books and, and your blogs, where do they go? Well, they can go to a site called JingleSamplers.com, JingleSamplers.com. And uh, I have written three books about the jingle industry, and they're available there. Plus, if people just like jingles, they can either download or listen to uh, montages of jingles until they can't stand it anymore. There's so much on it. <laughs> I may be going down a few of those rabbit holes myself. Ken Deutsch, who co-produces that rare and scratchy rock and roll podcast. We've featured Dave Milberg here uh, on the broadcast many times. Say hi to Radio Day for us, and thanks, Ken. I'll do that, and thanks a lot for having me. I had a good time. News next from the Northwestern Medicine Newsroom.